Okay, so thank you for joining us today. I'm Dave Cocking and I'm joined by Design Builders Managing Director Andy Tyndale. In this webinar, we'll show you how the Design Builder optimization tools can be used to design a net zero energy building. We expect the presentation to last just over an hour and there'll be time at the end to answer your questions which you can submit at any time during the webinar via the questions box in the webinar control panel. The webinar is being recorded so you will be able to access it later if you need to. We're joined today by Dr. Omer Karaguzel from Carnegie Mellon University who will explain how he designed and optimised the PV system for the building by taking the design builder model and linking with tools like Rhino and Grasshopper. Omer will also be available to answer your questions at the end. The net zero building we'll use during the webinar as a vehicle to explain the process is the one designed for the recent ASHRAE Energy Modelling Competition where the design builder team won the award for the most innovative workflow. Before I dive into the details of the design process, I'll provide a very brief overview of Design Builder for anyone watching this webinar with no prior exposure to our software. Design Builder provides advanced building performance modeling tools in an easy to use interface that gives architects, engineers, contractors, and energy modelers easy access to the power of simulation engines such as Energy Plus and Radiance. You can quickly import or build your geometry, then use our advanced data management system for fast and efficient data input to run energy, comfort, HVAC, daylighting and CFD simulations for design or for compliance with codes such as LEED. All these analyses are run seamlessly using the same model in our fully integrated software suite. Optimization is a term used extensively in the building energy modeling community, but it does have different meanings. In the context of design builder optimization and this webinar, what we're talking about is an advanced and automated form of cost benefit analysis using genetic algorithms to automatically identify the combination of design options that best meets your design objectives. In simple terms, Design Builder manages batches of Energy Plus simulations using a range of design variables such as glazing, insulation, lighting and HVAC systems as optimization parameters. The results of the simulations are assessed using a genetic algorithm that finds the fittest solutions, which are then carried forward into the next batch of simulations. The process mimics the survival of the fittest principle survival of the fittest principle of natural evolution and is repeated until the best combinations of variables have been found. I'll explain some of the fundamental concepts using this slide. Firstly we set objectives against which the optimizer evaluates the results. In this case the objectives are capital cost and net site energy. What you're trying to find is the optimum trade-off between the objectives, which typically conflict, i.e. you'll often find that energy consumption will reduce with high-performance, more costly solutions. Constraints can be used to rule out invalid solutions, such as high discomfort hours. These are shown by the yellow dots, so a solution which fails a constraint is not identified as optimal. We can select from over 120 different design variables such as orientation, insulation, HVAC and lighting systems. The re results of each simulation are tested against the objectives you set, in this case to minimise the capital cost and energy consumption. The genetic algorithm intelligently selects the solutions which best match your design objectives and chooses the strongest bal balance of solutions to carry forward into subsequent batches or generations for analysis. Design Builder plots the results cloud as it develops and iterates towards the final solution set. 
The optimal results, i.e. those which can't be beaten in terms of your design objectives, are shown in red on the leading edge of the results cloud. This leading edge is called the Pareto front and the points on it are the Pareto optimal solutions. I'll now use a very short video to show how the Pareto front develops for a small model. You can see that in this case, the design objectives are discomfort hours on the y-axis and operational carbon emissions on the x-axis. The cloud of points forms from the individual simulations with their own unique combination of design variables. Valid solutions that don't fail constraints are shown in white. The solution set migrates towards the origin through iteration as solutions get closer to design objectives. See how a denser cloud forms towards the origin. The Pareto front identifies the range of optimal solutions unbeaten on both carbon and discomfort objectives. The Pareto front typically shows diminishing returns at each end of the curve, with those solutions offering a balanced trade-off between objectives often being closest to the origin. It's impossible to test such a wide range of design variable combinations using traditional manual or parametric methods. Optimization provides greater confidence that all viable design alternatives have been tested based on the specific building and location defined in the base model. Here's a poster which summarizes the three step optimization approach we're going to describe today. The first step is all about minimizing heating and cooling loads by optimizing the building orientation, form and fabric, i.e. taking the fabric first approach to design. Once the loads were minimized, we set about optimizing the systems such as HVAC and lighting required to meet those loads. And once the building's main features and systems were optimized, we fine tuned the design including, for example, optimizing the PV system, as Omer will explain a little later. Before looking at the design and processes, it's worth noting that the building's location is Pittsburgh in the USA, and that our client's requirement was for a mixed mode or hybrid building capable of natural ventilation cooling where appropriate. Looking at the first stage in more detail, you can see that we initially ran optimization studies on seven building forms, six suitable for mixed mode operation and one traditional fully conditioned deep plan building to check our assumption that this would not be optimal in this climate. These seven models were all produced from one base model in a site with surrounding buildings. Once the base model was completed, it was copied to create other models, geometry deleted, DXF plans imported, and geometry and zoning quickly recreated. All model data, such as activities, constructions and glazing, was input using templates stored as library data, which meant that the only model data input required for the six additional buildings was assigning activities to zones and PV panel data input. Had we not had fairly tight site constraints, it's likely that there would have been greater differences in results for the various geometries. Experience tells us that a perfectly orientated long narrow building would usually perform best given the mixed mode and passive design requirements. However, in our case, there was not room on the site for this sort of building form. When the optimization results for the seven different solutions were all plotted onto this graph and compared, they were all broadly similar, except for the deep plan solution, which, as expected, tended to perform worse. As the results were similar, it gave the architect the flexibility to choose the rectangle with courtyard option to provide a design with a nice sheltered external space for the occupants. This poster and further information on the Design Builder team submission to the ASHRAE competition are available from the Design Builder website.
So here's the model that we selected on completion of the first stage of optimizations, which I'll use to explain the optimization model data setup. The site geometry and the associated shading and reflection of adjacent buildings has been taken into account but simplified so that it provides a reasonable balance between simulation time and accuracy. This is important when potentially running hundreds or thousands of simulations during an optimization run. Ground blocks were used to set the correct base height for each adjacent building. This is an open plan office where you can see that the elevator zones, etc., use standard opaque partitions. Virtual partitions are used to enable detailed modeling of nap vent and daylighting between perimeter and core zones without adding thermal mass. The color coded key shows the zone activity settings at this level. Design Builder uses a hierarchical data management system, meaning the most common data, in this case the activity data here on the activity tab, is set at building level and that data is automatically inherited by all zones. So in this office building, where most of the zones are offices, I only need to go to the non-office zones to set a different activity. Minimizing data input like this reduces both data input time and the possibility of making a mistake. These templates were set up in the base model with all the necessary data, so it was very quick to simply load the required activity template to the non-office zones created in the six additional models. Using the templates enabled the data to be quickly loaded into new models from the base model. Template settings and internal gains in this model are based on ASHRAE requirements. We used the construction templates to minimize the number of optimization design variables. We created different templates with different combinations of thermal mass and thermal insulation. This way, we only needed to use the construction template as one optimization design variable to include all possible construction options, rather than having the floors, walls, roof, etc. as separate variables. The base construction templates were duplicated with building integrated photovoltaics, or BIPV enabled, so that the optimizer could also choose BIPV where appropriate. Here's one of the construction templates, which you can see contains the data for the elements that make up the thermal envelope of the building. Each tab contains the relevant constructions in that category. And in each of those constructions, you define the thermal performance, thickness, cost, etc. All the BIPV related constructions are stored here in the Building Integrated Photovoltaics folder. Here I'll take a look at the edit dialog for this construction. Firstly note the BIPV category is set here. This is important. This four layer construction is an externally insulated wall with high thermal mass and insulation levels, giving a U value of around 0.1 watts per meter square K. Cost data can either be input using a lumped value, as here, which might come from a cost database such as RS Means or from your own cost library. 
you can use this auto calculate option which will sum the cost data entered for each individual layer in the construction. Note that Design Builder does provide default cost data. Given the cost variations regionally and even between projects in the same region, this gives you a good starting point in the, absent, in the absence of project specific data. I'll now take a look at the way the PV panels were specified. The panels themselves were created by drawing them onto the roof surface. If I navigate to one of the panels, I can see and where necessary, edit its properties. The generation tab is where we can define how many electric load centers there will be in our model. Electric load centers can include PV panels or wind turbines. Here we have one load center which has 12 PV panels. The load centers called PVX are the 12 PV options used in the optimization. So the optimizer is free to choose any number between 1 and 12 panels in order to find the optimum. Going to the PV times 12 edit dialog, you can set up the necessary parameters. And here you can see that the supporting infrastructure cost is zero, as this was lumped in with the panel cost. The generators assigned to the load center are shown here in the generator list. The generator type can either be PV, panel, or BIPV. That hopefully gives you a sense of how the initial models were produced and some of the key points relating to the way model data can be configured for optimization. Clearly, there were other important variables such as glazing, where a variety of double, triple and quadruple options were assessed, and shading, where a variety of louvers were assessed. But unfortunately, we don't have time to review everything during the webinar today. The initial optimization was focused on load reduction, so systems to meet those loads, such as lighting and HVAC, were simply set the same in every model, so they'd not affect the optimization comparisons. It's also important to point out that great care is needed to fully QA check models before running optimization studies. I'll now take a look at the optimization problem setup and the results. The problem is set up using three steps via the Objectives, Constraints and Design Variables tabs. Firstly, we need to define the objectives, which are essentially the targets that the optimizer uses to assess and compare results. In this case, the objectives are to minimize net site energy and capital expenditure, or CAPEX. So the optimizer will look for solutions which minimize energy and cost and will favor those when deciding which solutions to take forward to future batches. You can choose up to two objectives from this extensive list, which are grouped by category. It would be well worth you taking a look at the available objectives, as there are some you may not expect, including, for example, life cycle cost, life cycle analysis, and unmet load hours. You could choose to set only one objective, which would result in a single line graph effectively identifying the best performing solution. 
It's the use of two objectives that gives the characteristic cloud of points and Pareto front. Here in the Constraints tab, constraints are set up to ensure that solutions are valid and do not breach predefined design targets, such as limits on cost or discomfort hours. The list of available constraints is the same as the objectives list, and you can set as many constraints as you need. In this case, we've set a comfort constraint of less than 50 hours to ensure that the best performing solutions when measured against our objectives, are also comfortable. You can choose up to 10 design variables, which are the elements in the design that you wish to vary to find the best combination. For this load reduction optimization, we selected window to wall percentages, ranging from 30 to 80%. Note that the step value is only used for parametric analysis. Local shading type with four louver options. Construction template with eight options, as I've just discussed. Site orientation ranging from zero to 345 degrees. Load center one is the PV array. Glazing type has five options, including a range of double, triple and quadruple windows. I mentioned earlier that Design Builder's hierarchical data management system can be used to good effect for optimization. In this case, the window to wall percentage was set at building level, and that data is inherited by all the blocks, zones and surfaces. That means you can very quickly set these parameters at the building level and only change them if required at one of the lower levels. We'll show how this capability was used in the stage two analysis shortly. Those of you more familiar with text or code based optimization data input will appreciate the amount of time this can save setting up the optimization study. Opening up the window to wall percentage variable edit dialog here, you can see the list of over 120 variables available for selection. In this case, we have a numerical variable, so we can set the range here. As optimization normally involves running hundreds or thousands of simulations, these are often run using fast simulation servers or cloud computing rather than on the local machine. Design Builder has a simulation manager accessed via the calculations edit dialog seen here which can be used to select how and where the calculations are run. The simulation manager enables you to queue and run multiple simulations in parallel, giving better utilization of multi-core processors and freeing up the local machine during longer simulations. This is essential for optimization. The three approaches that we've most successfully found for running optimization studies are either using a dedicated simulation server on your own network or making use of a cloud simulation server such as Jess Online. Going to the main results graph, you can see the cloud of points and the Pareto front, i.e. the red Pareto optimal solutions at the leading edge of the cloud, as mentioned earlier. You can also see that a large number of results shown in yellow failed the comfort constraint, so are not valid solutions. 
You can often learn a lot about the most important driving forces in your design variables by the shape of the results cloud. Here you can see a defined split between the higher cost, lower energy and the lower cost, higher energy solutions. Clicking on the points that represent the optimal solutions on the Pareto front takes you to the relevant solutions in the grid below the graph. Doing this, we can quickly establish that the solutions in the upper left grouping are those with BIPV. And those towards the bottom right have no BIPV. The smooth range of the bottom right Pareto points is largely due to the selection of different numbers of rooftop panels. So more panels towards the left end of that line is more expensive, but it does reduce the net energy consumed. The relatively large gap between BIPV and non-BIPV solutions is due to us only selecting BIPV on or off at building level in the initial analysis. You'll see how we finesse that in later stages. The optimum value trends observed from this first optimization were window to wall ratios around 30%, building orientation around zero degrees, which was fortunately aligned roughly with the site layout, double glazing, and no shading was preferred. This leads us to the second stage, where we optimised the HVAC and lighting systems used to meet our, envi our environmental comfort requirements. We were surprised by the preference for no shading in the stage one results, so did some incremental testing at the beginning of stage two, and found that the range of shading devices we originally selected was insufficient. The original louvers all provided too much shading. So we included a variety of overhang lengths and the optimizer recommended 0.5 meter shading on all but the east facade where 0.3 meters was preferred. We believe this reduction on the east facade was due to the overall benefit of early morning solar gain through the year. The HVAC system optimization in the second stage, we tested a representation, a representative range of systems. And for HVAC, we included traditional VAV and fan core systems, but also included slightly more progressive ground source heat pump and ground source variable refrigerant flow with DOAS systems. At the time we were doing the HVAC modelling for this building, our detailed HVAC capability wasn't fully hooked up to the optimization tool. Our approach was to simulate these systems individually using detailed HVAC and extract seasonal efficiency and auxiliary energy consumption data from those simulations, which we then used as inputs to our simple HVAC modelling. It's worth noting that we've since added an option to allow a range of detailed HVAC system templates to be tested as optimization design variables. So here's the stage two model. Looking at the lighting tab, we selected three main lighting types. each with and without daylight control, giving us a total of six lighting systems. The lighting types were LED, T5 and T8 fluorescent.
In the lighting template edit dialog, we can specify the lighting performance data, daylight controls, and cost. In this case, cost is specified on a simple per occupied floor area basis. The HVAC model data tab is where our simple HVAC system data is input. Here's the list of templates created for the stage two optimization. The data from the detailed HVAC models I mentioned earlier was input into a template for each of the four system types modeled. The template is a mechanism for storing and quickly loading bulk data to the tab. So it's ideal for optimization purposes where we can simply set the HVAC template as one of our design variables. I'll now take a look at the optimization settings for this second analysis. The objectives to minimize net site energy and capex are the same as the stage one analysis. The comfort constraint is also the same. This time the design variables are different focusing on HVAC, lighting and BIPV. The first thing you'll notice is that these variables are all template selections, so there are no minimum and maximum range values. The edit dialog for the HVAC template, for example, allows us to select which HVAC systems we wish to include in our optimization study. Here at the bottom of the list is our project folder. This is where our four systems were selected. The HVAC and lighting templates were applied at building level. level. However, it is possible to target design variables at different levels in the model when required. In the first optimization, we applied BIPV only at the building level. But here in this second stage model, we've refined that and created one variable for each facade. This approach enables the optimizer to identify whether BIPV should be applied to all, none, or some of the facades. Going to the edit variable dialog for the BIPV south variable, I can open up this target objectives, target, sorry, target objects dialog to select which facades of the model I wish to apply this variable to. If I show the zone surface in a south outer zone, I can see that the south facing external walls have been selected. However, this is not the case in other non-south facing zones. I'll now briefly discuss and show you the detailed HVAC modeling and the system that we finally selected. The simulation and optimization results indicated that the HVAC system with the lowest energy consumption was the ground source heat pump with heated floors and chilled beams. This was primarily due to the relatively low heating flow temperatures and high chilled water flow temperatures working very well with the ground source heat pump to yield high seasonal efficiencies. Although the ground source heat pump system offered the lowest theoretical energy consumption, 
Our HVAC designers were concerned about the practicality of this system in real life. The main concern related to operating a mixed mode nap vent system with a cool beam system due to the potential for humid outside air condensing on the chilled beam surfaces. Given this was a competition with a vol volunteer modelling team and design time was tight, we decided to go for the next best performing system, which was the ground source VRF with DOAS. This is more resilient system to design and only slightly less efficient to operate. The ground source VRF with DOAS system is shown on this slide. At the heart of the system are the three VRF outdoor units, one per building storey. These are served by a ground loop, which improves heating and cooling efficiency compared to using outside air for heat rejection. The DOAS system provides only the required amount of ventilation air based on occupancy using CO2 control. The system is configured so that natural ventilation is enabled only when it's beneficial. The domestic hot water and heating coil in the DOAS are supplied by a separate heat pump, which is also served by the ground loop. The domestic hot water is preheated by waste heat recovered from the heat pump condenser. And the ground floor VRF outdoor unit, which has to cope with high cooling loads from elevators and an IT server room. Here are the optimization results for the second stage analysis. Again, clicking on any point on the graph takes you to the summary results for that solution. The results in the grid below are sorted in order of the objectives, starting with the highest cost and lowest net site energy at the top left of the graph, and working down to the least expensive highest energy consumers at the bottom right. This ordering of results makes it very easy to scroll down the results list and get a sense of the common features that produce the results of most interest to you. By clicking on the Pareto optimal points and looking at the grid, you can see that the solutions at the top left have the expensive, high performing components such as ground source heat pump, LED with daylight control, and BIPV on all facades, even the north. This might give the lowest energy consumption, but at a very high cost. We knew that we wanted to get just below the net zero energy consumption line for this project, so could focus in on the solutions around that point to see what they tell us. The main variables driving the shape of the graph are those for BIPV on the four facades, since they have a major impact on both electricity generation and cost. The gradient of the cost versus energy Pareto front tells us the cost benefit trade-off. So on reflection, you might be surprised that the Pareto front is nearly a straight line from beginning to end, as it means that we get a similar cost benefit trade off when adding BIPV on each of the facades. Even the northwest facade receives low angle radiation in the summer, so has a reasonable cost benefit. The solutions in the area of the Pareto front just below net zero show a HVAC system preference for either ground source heat pump or VRF and typically have LED lighting with daylight control and only have BIPV on the south facade.
We don't have time to review every optimization model, but I'm sure that many of you will have been interested to see from the poster that we also used optimization to do some analysis on the optimum heating and cooling setback temperatures, the natural ventilation cooling set point temperature, and unmet load hours. The building is well insulated, airtight, and has high thermal mass. So we found that it was not very sensitive to setback temperature. The reason for this is that it doesn't gain or lose much heat and the thermal mass creates much more stable internal temperatures. In this case, the optimizer recommended heating setback temperatures below those typically required for fabric protection. So we could have set a more appropriate range to eliminate that. The optimum cooling setback of 89 Fahrenheit and NatVent cooling set point of 73 Fahrenheit are consistent with the normal design builder default values. The unmet load hours after this optimization were 17 hours for heating and zero hours for cooling. The final stage of our three stage process was fine tuning the design. During that stage, we used other tools such as Radiance and DaySim for daylighting analysis and CFD for more detailed comfort analysis. As these tools are fully integrated within Design Builder, we're able to undertake these analyses using the same model geometry and much of the data already contained in the model. The most important part of the detailed fine tuning stage was the final PV design to meet the residual loads and achieve our goal of net zero site energy consumption. I'll now hand over to Dr. Omer Karaguzel from Carnegie Mellon University, who will explain how he optimized the PV design. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I would like to talk about our parametric modeling studies that we conducted for the Azure Lowdown Showdown Design Competition. Our main objectives in these studies was to explore some innovative methods for geometric optimization of the rooftop solar power systems of our design proposal. We carefully designed these PV systems as key renewable technologies to get to our ultimate goal of net zero energy balance. Our approach uh, to reach this objective depends on the connectivity or interoperability of the design builder with the 3D modeling program of Rhino by the use of algorithmic modeling tool, the Grasshopper. So at this point, let's have a closer look at our integrated approach on this step-by-step -step process diagram. We created the source building geometry, including the surrounding context and the geometry of the solar PV within Design Builder's 3D interface. Next step was to export this source geometry to Rhino using 3D drawing exchange file format. Design Builder's own export functions help us to generate this 3D DXF file. Uh, we are calling this as a source geometry because the PV geometry is already existing in Rhino as a source, but the key parameters are not yet optimized for maximum solar energy yields. Right at this point, we started to develop an associated geometry, or in other words, parametric geometry of this 3D model within Grasshopper. As opposed to visual geometry of Rhino, which is static in nature, uh, the parametric geometry is dynamic. This means that each and every geometric entity, including the PV services, are parameterized, such that every geometric input, the length, the height, rotation angles, global positions, translation and transformation vectors are represented by grasshopper objects using numeric values. 
these numeric variables can be changed and controlled manually by the user or automatically by an optimization algorithm. In our study, we define two independent geometric variables. These are the tilt angle of the PV arrays and the distance between each row of successive PV arrays. Next step was to set up an optimization scheme in Grasshopper. We got the use of a single objective genetic optimizer named Galapagos. This optimizer finds the optimum tilt angle and the PV array distance to maximize the total annual in-plane solar radiation on the surface of the PV arrays. Uh, that's to say, the solar radiation was our fitness value or objective function value in this problem. Uh, the open source environmental plugins called Ladybug and Honeybee enable the calculation of solar radiation levels. These plugins for Grasshopper provide us a range of components that can import our weather data for our location in the form of EPW, Energy Plus Weather Files. They can generate a cumulative sky matrix for a selected period. They can also calculate the solar radiation on building surfaces by taking into account the solar shading effects. After a certain number of iterations, the optimizer evaluates all candidate solutions and find the optimal PV geometry. In our case, we ended up with a 26 degrees tilt angle and 2.4 meters of array distance. This specific combination yields maximum solar radiation, which is the most significant factor in PV power production, as we know. But please pay attention that we achieve this PV geometry optimization under the given urban context by taking into account shading from the neighboring buildings and all shading from adjacent rows of PV arrays. We bake this optimized geometry into a line of scene to make it static again. And we also got the use of some color-coded mappings, as you see, of the solar radiation levels on the surface, which can provide us design decision support. We can export this optimized geometry back to design builder by converting the primary model into the GBXML file. A dedicated IB plugin is used for this process. But this GBXML-based connectivity closes the entire interoperability loop between Design Builder, our modeling program, and Rhino Grasshopper, the parametric modeling tools. Energy Plus-based simulations with Design Builder help us to achieve an optimized PV system with a peak power of around 216 kilowatts. Such an on-site solar energy generation makes it possible to meet the entire consumption needs of our VOD design. On top of it, with the same PV system, we even have a small amount of extra energy that eventually renders our proposal as a positive energy building. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. That's all from me today. And I will be happy to answer your questions at the end of our webinar. Okay, many thanks, Omer, for that very informative summary. I'm sure many of our viewers will have been very interested to see how you can take a design builder model, export it into other tools such as Rhino and Grasshopper to carry out specific analyses, and then import the new model back into Design Builder. That's great stuff. Here's an image of the final PV design resulting from Omer's work. A small addition to the rear roof panel and a courtyard shade, plus some small PV overhangs on the south facade here, meant that the more expensive BIPV was ultimately only required on the south facade to get below net zero. Before finishing your, for your questions, 
I'd just like to take a minute to summarize and reflect on the process we've just explained. In stage one, we analyzed different building shapes and used optimization to minimize the heating and cooling loads by including design variables such as orientation, insulation, glazing, and shading devices. We used the fabric first approach, trying to ensure that all those important design decisions such as orientation and shape that lock in the intrinsic performance of the building for its life were made in a fully informed way. Once we'd selected a building shape and set the orientation, glazing and fabric parameters based on our stage one results, we optimized our lighting and HVAC systems in order to meet our environmental set points as cost effectively as possible. At that stage, we selected a design which was near net zero on our second optimization Pareto front. Finally, we did some fine tuning on that model and designed a PV system that would meet the residual loads and get us just below net zero. We could, of course, have selected a more expensive, high-performing design from our range of Pareto Optimal Solutions if we'd wanted to. One of the great strengths of optimization is that it provides a range of viable options, which is a great starting point for a conversation with the client. So the question in the end boiled down to how low did we want to go? And the optimization tools gave us the ability to make a fully informed cost benefit judgment. In this case, we chose a cost optimal solution that took us just below the net zero line.